Uh, welcome to Tune In Tuesday, Session 2 of the One God of Original Christianity. Yeah. So, who is God? That question has fascinated men and women for ages. As the book of Romans declares, we can see his handiwork everywhere. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 it says, because that which we may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, his attributes. So we can see God in the things that he has made. If we got a Swiss watch and opened up the box and wound it up and put it on our wrist and then moments later it went and came apart, boy, we'd say the guy that made this watch, he was a fool. He didn't know what he was doing. But if we buy something and it keeps on ticking and it keeps on working, then we could say, well, he who designed this was really an expert. Well, you look at the world, you look at the things in the world, you look at all the wonderful things in life and in the universe, and you just have to say, well, this didn't happen by accident. There has to be something behind this. And you can see the attributes of the maker in what he made. But God is spirit. He resides outside of the realm of that we are in, the realm of the five senses. We can't see him or put him in a test tube to analyze him because if that's true, then how can we know him? Well, he reveals himself to us. That one of his attributes is he is love. Well, if God is love, then love needs companions. And companions have to have free will to love and to have free will and to love you must know who you are loving and so therefore it follows that he has to reveal himself to us if he loves us some people think that God is so 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 pure that he's so aloof and so far off he doesn't care about what goes on with us but that's not true he loves us and because of that he reveals himself to his chosen representatives and then their job is to teach the rest of us like Moses was the one that taught the children of Israel and the Apostle Paul was one who taught us in the New Testament well the Apostle Paul found himself in a situation one time when he was in Athens look at Acts chapter 17 Acts chapter 17 So they had left him in Athens, and it says in verse 23, For as I passed by, I beheld your, the Athenians, devotions. And he says, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So they wanted to make sure that they had covered all the gods possible. And he said, Whom therefore you guys in Athens ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. (laughs) God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with man's hands, or works, of course, as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him, although he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Well, that's a mind picture, isn't it? Trying to find God. He says, here I am, here I am. So Paul was speaking to the residents of Athens. That happened to be a great philosophical and intellectual center of the world. But yet, there they still were in that cosmic game of pin the tail on the donkey, blindfolded to the things of the Spirit, trying to find God anywhere but missing Him everywhere. 
Athens was the cradle of Western culture and philosophy, yet they still worship ignorantly. That's really a statement. So why were they, and we too today, still not finding him? Because we both have been searching according to our human ideas and not his. So from the days of old, man's primal curious nature has driven us to look for God in order to fill that part in humankind that's been missing since Adam and Eve lost their spirit. They once had spirit and commune with God by means of it, but then they sinned and on that very day it died. Consequently, mankind's been missing a part ever since. That's our hunger for spiritual things. But instead of heeding God, many have utilized their human logic and built great systems of philosophy and theology, which seem to be holy and true, but actually they are missing the mark. We've been trying to fit God into the bounds of our crude definitions of him, but he transcends them. God is infinitely beyond awesome. He's so wondrous. They would short sort of rain cells to comprehend him. That's why we won't be able to see him until we get new bodies, and then we'll be able to stand it. <laughs> but yet he still reaches down to us, revealing parts of his glorious nature. We would do well to heed his words and not try to theorize beyond what he has revealed to us and intrude into forbidden territory. Take a look at Deuteronomy 29.29. Deuteronomy 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed to us belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So, there are some things that are out of bounds. There are some things that are off limits. And see, that's how many seekers have erred. In our hunger and curiosity, we've trespassed beyond what God has revealed. So, they were revealed for a purpose. They are for us and our children, so we can carry out what we're supposed to do. So, it behooves us to heed the ones that God has sent to us first, and work those. And there's more than enough to work. (laughs) We won't run out of stuff to work. And just make sure that we don't go into the forbidden territory. Then he has sent prophets, and he will designate those prophets and back them up with signs and wonders following. And of all the prophets in the Old Testament, which the Jews got their beliefs regarding God from, Moses was the greatest. Look at Exodus 33. Exodus 33, 8, it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Boy, what respect they had for God and his word. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Isn't that amazing? Moses knew the Lord face to face. Now, other holy men and women have not had quite the same entree with God that Moses did. Nonetheless, they were still confirmed as prophets, but just not quite as spectacular as Moses. Numbers chapter 12. There was a situation where Miram and Aaron got kind of jealous or whatever of this closeness. And so in Numbers 12... They said, Hath the Lord God indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken by us? And the Lord heard it. (laughs) Look at verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. Now, this does not mean that he was a pushover. Because you can't be a pushover and demand to Pharaoh, let my people go. No, Moses was not a pushover. But he was meek. Meek means to be teachable. And part of that meekness, that teachableness, is a hunger. It is a teach me, teach me, teach me. I want to know. 
see? Plus, also, it's not like I want to know because I can be great. Or it's it's not like I want to know so I can be better than you. It's not that kind of knowing. It is that kind of meekness and teachableness is, is a humility and a hunger and a purpose where you treat the information properly. It's not an egotistical thing at all. These are all the traits that were in Moses. He was very meek above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. So that's why he had that relationship. And verse 4, And the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses, Aaron, and to Miram. He said, Come ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. They skedaddled over there. And the Lord came down on a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle. And he called Aaron and Miram. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold." Wow. (laughs) Wow. So I think maybe we should heed the words of Moses (laughs) when it comes to what he has said about God. I mean, in Deuteronomy 34.10, the Bible says, There has not been a prophet since who knew the Lord like he did. So if the depth of insight of the other genuine Old Testament prophets didn't equal Moses's, how much less <laughs> the words of the pagan Greek philosophers upon which Western culture is founded. It therefore is in the Pentateuch and the writings of Moses that we can garner the greatest knowledge of God, the God of the Hebrews. It was Moses' hunger for truth which brought out this depth So, even from the inception of Moses' ministry to Israel, we have an understanding of who God was. See, Exodus 3 is the beginning of Moses' ministry. Even from the inception of Moses' ministry, one of the greatest themes of his heart was, Who are you, God? (laughs) Because in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel... And say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? In other words, what Moses was saying is, Look, I have not been back to Egypt for 40 years. Okay, he's 80 years old at this point. He had not spoken Egyptian in 40 years. He had been out in Midian, right? And they spoke Aramaic. And the people back in the uh, in Egypt, the believers, they spoke Hebrew. So he hadn't spoken Hebrew either, right? And he's saying, hey God, you know, you're, you're sending me back, right, to Egypt. And so I'm supposed to be a prophet, right? Well, yeah, I'm going to go back to Egypt and talk to my people. And I'm going to say, well, I'm a prophet. And you know what they're going to say? Yeah, right. So how am I going to prove to them that I am a prophet? Show me something new about your name. See, that's what Exodus 3.13 is talking about. See, what is his name? That does not mean that the Jews did not know the name of their God. (laughs) In, In the Ten Commandments movie, remember? It has the he who has no name thing. Well, I mean, when has Hollywood ever been right? (laughs) No, that does not mean that they did not know his name because they used the name of God. El and Elohim and Adonai and Yahweh or Jehovah, whatever your flavor is. It's all through the book of Genesis. So they knew God by all of his major names. I mean, they occur over 160 times in Genesis. So, what is his name does not mean that. Okay? It means, Lord, show me something new about your name so I can answer their questions about your name. Because we know that the name of God is more than just his label. It's what he stands for. 
See? Genesis has several occurrences of they called upon the name of the Lord. Well, how could they do that if they didn't know it? So the name Yahweh or Jehovah, that later on comes up in Exodus 3, had to have been known. But Now, of course, in Exodus 6, 2, and 3, it says, And God, Elohim, spake unto Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, Jehovah, or Yahweh, and I appeared to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai. But my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. But if you look, Eve did know God by that name. She used it in Genesis 4.1. Noah built Jehovah an altar in Genesis 8.20. And he spoke the name in Genesis 9.26. Abraham built Jehovah an altar in Genesis 12.7 and called upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah, there in the, the next verse. And again in Genesis 13, 4. It says, Abraham believed the Lord, Jehovah, in Genesis 15, 6. Hagar called on the name of Jehovah in Genesis 16, 13. In Genesis 18, 14, Abraham said, Is anything too hard for Jehovah? Isaac entreated the Lord in Jehovah in Genesis 25, 21. Jacob used that name in Genesis 48, 18. So, they obviously did know God by that name. So, what's the solution to this apparent contradiction? Well, it must be they didn't know as much as could be known. And, in Exodus 3, God reveals more. So, I think that's what that means. See, just think for a moment. How big is God? I mean, he's bigger than we can comprehend. He has some traits that are incomprehensible, like infinitude. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. (laughs) So, surely there will be things about him that we don't know. Now, surely it's not one of his names, all right? (laughs) But in the book of Judges, an angel said that his own name was incomprehensible. Remember that? Well, if an angel has an incomprehensible name, what about God? John 17, 5 declares it will take eternity to get to know infinity. So, we're still going to be learning things about God for a long, 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 long time. So, back in Moses' day, there certainly could be more to learn. So, I think that's what, by my name, Jehovah, was not known to them. They used the name. They just didn't know the fullness of it, because there's more to learn. So, to best understand this, we have to look at things from a Semitic point of view, and not Western. Like, in session one, I talked about the name of God not merely referring to his label. In the Semitic mind, one's name was also one's significance. So the name of God was his reputation, what he's done, what he stands for, not merely who he is. Here's another example of that in Isaiah 55. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 11. This is an example of the Semitic concept of what is in a name. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Look at the beauty in all those figures of speech. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Uh, Myrtle trees are indicative of peace. And it says, And it shall be to the Lord for a name. See? So this is his reputation for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So, also I found some more information about names. In the Blue Letter Bible, they had a lot of good information. They didn't apply it completely correctly. They added some theological layers to it that I don't agree with. But they said a name can indicate physical characteristics. For example, when Esau, Jacob's brother, was born in Genesis 25-25, The first one, it says, came out red all over like a hairy garment. And so, they called his name Harry. That's what Esau means. That was one of his physical characteristics. Also, a name indicates authority. 
Now, we say, stop in the name of the law, right? So, when Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, well, he came in his Father's authority. God sent him. He gave him work to do, and Jesus did these works in his Father's name. Also, Jesus said, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So, everything was in his hands because he was our substitute. So we were identified in him. He sacrificed himself for all of our sin. So everything was in his hands. Later on, the judgments are committed to him. Jesus said in John 5.26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. So Jesus had authority he came in his father's name. Then another thing about names. Sometimes your name was changed. When people were appointed to a new position of authority, it was a cultural thing, a biblical cultural thing to give them a new name. So Pharaoh gave Joseph a new name, which I can't pronounce, some Egyptian thing. Okay, When he was appointed Grand Vizier, over all Egypt in Genesis 41-45. Daniel and his three companions were renamed uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They were named something in Babylonian. Also, this was an indication of ordination. They didn't say reverend so-and-so. They gave them a new name. So, John and James were the sons of thunder. Ooh, that's cool. Or Barnabas, son of consolation. Jacob was renamed Israel. Also, a name reveal, can reveal the character of the person. For example, uh, Nabal. Nabal means foolish. And when Nabal affronted King David, Abigail, Nabal's wife, said, Well, his name is, so he is he. 1 Samuel 25, 25. Nabal was a foolish man, and his name revealed it. Now, Jacob, actually the word Jacob means heel snatcher. (laughs) Because when they were born, Jacob and Esau were twins, right? And now, picture this childbirth. They were wrestling while they were being born. And Esau stuck his hand out first. And then it drew back in. Wow, that must have been painful childbirth. Oh my goodness. But the midwife had the presence of mind to tie a string around that finger. Wow! And then Jacob came out first, holding on to the heel of his brother. So he called him a heel snatcher. These are what's in a name in their culture. So that's why when Moses said, God, what is your name? They're going to ask me what your name is. Please tell me something about your name. It's not like my name is Fred. (laughs) No. It was more about his reputation so that then Moses could prove to the children of Israel that he indeed was a prophet with deeper understanding of God. But you know what? You know what the cool thing is about this? Is it didn't stop there. We're going to see that Jehovah or Yahweh has ten different redemptive names. The Lord our healer the Lord is our righteousness, the Lord who is there, all of those things. And several of those redemptive names were put forth by the prophet Moses. So this was one of the themes of his ministry. See, And that's true for many apostles and prophets throughout the word. There have been major themes that when God called them and told them, I want you to do so-and-so. That was their theme throughout their ministry. And I think this was one of Moses' themes. The in-depth who God is. And it's very interesting in my teaching about the seven qualities of the Holy Spirit in session four of Jesus Christ our Lord. I talk about the quality of the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord. And that falls into what would be positive discerning of spirits. 
Moses discerned God's spirit. That's really cool. He majored on who is God. And that's why the Pentateuch, with all of that, comes from Moses. It's a huge volume of stuff because he was the meekest man upon the earth. He had a great hunger for the truth. Isn't that neat? That's a model to emulate, isn't it? (laughs) But before we launch more into what God taught Moses in Exodus 3 about Yahweh, so I want to restate an important point from session one, because there are some believers who insist that we have to refer to God by his correct names in Hebrew. We have to say them just right, or else God is not going to give us as much favor as the other ones who can say it. Well, I think that's a legalistic notion, and they strongly infer that if we comply, we will receive greater blessings. And and they also certainly claim superiority because they know these things. See? <laughs> and that's just another work of the flesh to crawl over somebody and lord over them with. Most believers in God don't speak Hebrew, so are they relegated to being second rate? I mean, like I said. In section 1, some languages don't even have the consonants that are part of the holy names. Like German does not have a a W sound. So how can you say Yahweh in German? Yahweh? Thunderbolts come down or something. (laughs) No. And then Koine Greek doesn't have an SH sound. So how can you say Yeshua, which is Jesus' name? Or it doesn't have a Y sound. It has an iota, which is close. So how could you say Yahweh? So I really don't think that a large percentage of the world is relegated to being second rate because they can't say those consonants that are in the holy names. It just does not make sense. Now, thankfully, though, there is some concrete proof, I believe, in original Christianity concerning this matter because all of the writers of the Bible have been Semitic, except for Luke. And they undoubtedly received revelation in their native language, and they called God by the name of those tongues, whatever those languages were. But many scholars believe that much of the New Testament stems from a Greek original. Well, if that's the case, why didn't it retain the Hebrew pronunciations? But there's historical evidence that Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew. And I think Matthew one twenty three is sufficiently uh, sufficient proof that it wasn't written in Greek because it says his name by interpretation is holds up, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that was inserted by the translator. But the point I do want to make is that when the Gospel of Matthew was translated into Greek, the first century translators did not stipulate that the name of God be uttered perfectly in Hebrew. They used that us when they translated it into Greek. See? I mean, this translation of Matthew may have been done, and probably was done, in the presence or with the assistance of the apostles, and maybe even Matthew himself. And then in the case of Paul, I believe that his epistles were in fact dual originals. Because Thessalonians, which is his first epistle that he writes, opens with Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus to the church of the Thessalonians. Well, that sort of sounds like they had something to do with writing it. Okay? Now, Paul was bilingual at least. He may have known Latin, too. Timothy definitely was bilingual. His mother was an airman and his father was a Greek. So, Timothy definitely was bilingual. And then Silas, he was from Jerusalem, so he probably spoke Hebrew in Aramaic. Okay? So there you have Aramaic and Greek represented among the writers of Thessalonians. Is that neat? So I think that it was a dual original. So that even is stronger to prove that it was not an issue among the apostles that we have to retain the Hebrew names perfectly and speak them. Okay? I mean, they used Greek, and Greek refers to God as theos, and it does not make 
the different distinctions between God's attributes like the Hebrew words do, as we're going to see. So I think that this insistence of perfect pronunciation is just another circle of legalistic control. It's simply another legalistic work of the flesh. Like, you know, I know something you don't know. See, it's just a way to lord it over people. And even worse, it was that same kind of legalism that actually lost the correct pronunciation of Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is the name that most Christians associate with God. It's probably that his name was Yahweh and not Jehovah. Okay, I'll explain how that occurred in another session. But some legalistic Jews advocated that we shouldn't utter that name, Yahweh, when reading it out loud because they thought they would possibly desecrate it by mispronouncing it. So, what they did is they added another layer of legalism, which was their tendency, because they built a fence around the law, adding other layers to it so that you couldn't possibly break it. They put another legalistic stipulation before you ever got to the point of breaking the actual law. So they added to it. They built another fence encircling it with men's commandments. And that actually became the seed of ordinances that men heaped on the law that God abhors. And they lost the pronunciation. It's ridiculous. But we're going to cover Yahweh and those four consonants that make it up that are called the tetragrammaton. Uh, we're going to cover that in another session. So, but before we get there, I have to go where angels fear to tread. Yeah. And I have to barge in on huge century old arguments in the theological world regarding God and the names of God. Unfortunately, I have to do it because there's four different arguments that I have to enter into that have raged for centuries <laughs> that I had to wade through this week and try to figure out what the truth was. So argument number one was between or is between the Jews and Orthodox Christians that the true God is either one or three. Okay, That's the first argument. Is the true God one or is the true God three? All right. The Jews say he's one, and the uh, Orthodox Christians say he's a trinity, he's a three. Argument number two is between Jews themselves regarding the etymology of the names of God. How El and Eloah and Allah and Elohim are related. They argue over that like crazy. Then, argument number three is between monotheistic Jews and mystic Jews regarding the meaning of the plural form of Elohim. Does Elohim in the plural mean there was a committee of high gods that made the world and everything in it? There are a group of people who believe that's what that shows. It was a committee of supernatural beings. All right. And then argument number four is between the Jews and the Muslims, especially regarding the etymology of the word Allah. So... <laughs> Yes, it is. Where angels fear to tread. Oh my gosh, what a headache. Well, after all this, we'll have to take two tablets and call back in the morning. <laughs> so, here, here we go. Now, basically, I think we can solve argument number one easily between the Jews and the Orthodox Christians. What much to the chagrin of the Orthodox Trinitarian Christians, because... The book of Acts records no disagreement between the Jews and the apostles regarding who God is. Right? So the apostles and the Jews believed in the same God in the same way. Okay? The main argument between them was whether Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah or not. And you can see that. It's all through the book of Acts. So the original Christians believed in one God just like the Jews did and still do today. There have been many attempts to focus Trinitarian ideas back upon ancient Judaism, but they all fail 
because they don't acknowledge the authority of Moses who knew God face to face. They actually think they know better than Moses, whether they verbally acknowledge it or not. They promote anachronistic attempts, things that are out of time, that are wrong-timed, imposing modern ideas on ancient culture. All right? Anachronistic attempts to, in effect, rewrite history, claiming nuances that were absolutely not in the mind of the prophet when he wrote what he wrote, which is presupposing that they knew better than the prophet himself. So the very fact that there was no argument in the book of Acts, and certainly if there were, it would have been recorded, right? Okay, so there was no argument between the Jews and the apostles regarding who God was. They just argued about who Jesus was, right? Okay, so they believed the same thing. The Lord our God is one God. The Lord our God is one Lord. So that settles argument number one as far as I'm concerned. All right. Argument number two is between El, Eloi, Ella, Elo, Eloa, Elohim, and Allah. They're, they're all very closely related. And they are used in scripture, so there is ample source material. There's enough for a statistical sample. All right? Not just one occurrence. There's more than one. Now, most ancient Hebrew etymologists... Now, these are not the people who study bugs. <laughs> They're the people who study words. Okay. <laughs> they're not entomologists, they're etymologists. Okay. So, anyway, they attest that the word L evolved from a root word LE, which is Aleph Yoth, Lamed Yoth, and in turn is derived from a word which is Aleph Vav Lamed, meaning one who desires to be strong or longs to be in front. El itself is a masculine singular noun, meaning mighty, as in man of high rank or power, mighty one. Now, I covered that in my Jesus Christ Our Lord class, session one, because the key to understanding Isaiah 9, 6, is it doesn't really say the mighty God in Hebrew, like all the translations want us to think. The word God is not Jehovah or Elohim. It's the word El. And El means mighty one. And yes, most of the time El is used of God, but also it is used of men, mighty ones. Also it's used of pagan deities. And so therefore, what's very interesting is that almost every occurrence of El in the Bible will have an adjective or a genitive case description with it to specify that the L being spoken of is God, to clarify. So, it means mighty one, powerful one. It's used of God, humans, angels, even pagan gods. And part of the argument is that Elohim is a plural form of El. But actually, the plural form of El is Elim. The Im suffix is like the S suffix in English, the plural suffix. Now, they also have dual, and they also have plural there, too. So there's different word endings. But there's a separate set of conjugations for all the forms for both El and for Elohim. So they are separate words and separate families. Okay, They're related a little bit, yes. We're going to see. Eli is found in Psalm 22.1 where it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's this Eli. It's also, Eli is found in many scriptural names which are compounded from that plus another Hebrew noun. So, Eli, Azer, my God is my help. My mighty one is my help. Eliezer, my God is my rock. Elib, my God is our father. Elimelech, My God is my king. Eliel, my God is my God. (laughs) Okay. Boy, when he was born, the father said, my God. No. (laughs) Sorry about that. Woo. Anyway, um, Elia is my, Eli is my, yeah. That's used in many compound words. Uh, Elioi is probably the most quoted Aramaic word in the epistles. Elioi, Elioi, Lama Sabatani. Okay. Um, 
or in one of the Gospels it's Eli, Eli. And those that's a quote of what Jesus called out from the cross. Elah, or that's Strong's 425, or Elo, which is Strong's 433. It means duke, or prince, or chief. Uh, Genesis 36, 40 and following has a number, talks about the dukes of Edom. Okay. And, and they drove an orange car. Right? Uh, that TV show, The Dukes of whatever it was. So anyway, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, that Elioi has an idea of worship or veneration added to it. Let's see. Then there's Elohi, which is something regarding worship as well. In Genesis thirty-three twenty, it talks about he erected an altar and called it Elohi Israel. Now, there's Elah, that's an Aramaic word, Strong's 426. That is divine veneration or to deify. It shows up in Ezra, Jeremiah, and Daniel because they contain Aramaic. Most of the Old Testament is Hebrew, but there are a few books that have Aramaic. So that's an Aramaic form. Now, you have Elohah, that's Strong's 433. This is a, the singular, actually, of Elohim, not El. So Eloah is regarding a heathen god, and it is not put into the plural. God is Elohim. It's put into a plural for majesty. It's a common thing in Hebrew to show something in its superlative by putting it in the plural. Something magnanimous, something with majesty. The heathen god doesn't deserve that kind of veneration, so the prophet put it in the singular, Eloah. Chronicles 32.15, Habakkuk 1.11. It shows up a lot in Job, Eloah, the singular of Elohim. Now, let's get to Allah. All of the ones that I've shown you so far have an E in them. Elohim, Eloah, Elah, El, right? Okay. So, in contrast to the E, which is a masculine vowel, Hebrew also has an A to show a feminine designation, and that's where Allah comes from. And now, in Hebrew, Allah means goddess. It's used with numerous Babylonian, Egyptian, Middle Eastern goddesses and temple prostitutes. That's where the Allah comes from. Now, remember I told you there's a fourth argument between the Jews and the Muslims, all right? What the Jews say about this is fighting words, <laughs> basically, because they say the ancient Arabic, Allah, is goddess. But I don't think that Muhammad picked Allah because of what the Jews say about it. Because what the Jews say about Allah is, is that it was the ancient Arabian moon goddess. (laughs) And so that's why they have a moon on the top of their steeple, is what the Jews say. Of course, them's fighting words. I've already gotten like two-thirds of all the religious people in the world angry at me and what I've said so far. So I don't want to add 1.5 billion more. So I'm not going to get in the middle of that argument. Because, you see, Hebrew is Hebrew, and Arabic is Arabic. And, yes, they are Semitic languages, but the Hebrew connotations don't go into Arabic. It's like comparing apples with oranges. So that argument that these Jews are raising against the Muslims' use of the word Allah is like comparing apples and oranges. Right? So it doesn't fly. I mean... That kind of logic is almost like the lyrics in the song Trouble in River City and the Music Man. You know, trouble with a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for fool. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense. So, I'm not going to get into that middle of that argument. You have L, and that's one root, and then you have L O I, and those are both singular nouns. And so L, its plural, is Elim, and L O I. Its plural is Elohim. So, uh, they are related because they all have a root of mightiness, but they're two separate groups 
of words that have all the different forms. So they're conjugated in different series. So they are separate words. They're not the same word in different forms. They're actually separate words. Right? You have Elohim. Most dictionaries state that a collective plural noun can be a singular noun denoting a group of individuals, yes. But also, it can be, if it has a singular uh, verb with it, that denotes majesty. And that's the case with Elohim. Elohim, even though it is a plural form, it occurs with verbs that are singular, right? So, in that case, the eem suffix, this is the, like an S in English. So, it is a plural word. But E.W. Bullinger showed in his Figures of Speech book that there is a figure called heterosis, which is defined as an exchange of mood, voice, tense, person, number, degree, or gender for another. And it includes an exchange of one form of the word for another, So when the singular is exchanged for the plural, that figure draws attention to or emphasizes the power or the authority or the magnitude of whatever word that is in the plural. It's called a majestic plural. This figure even occurs in English when the queen says, we the queen of England, when she makes a decree. That is a time that, according to form, they are emphasizing their authority. So they would phrase it like that. Another famous quote of the Queen is, We are not amused. (laughs) And you could look that up on the internet and see what the circumstances of that one was. The Queen herself, who is a singular, said, We are not amused. Ooh. Let's look at some of the occurrences of Elohim. Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God, all the way through, the whole chapter of Genesis is, of Genesis 1, is Elohim. So, Elohim is God the creator. Okay? Having to do with creation. So, God said there was, let there be light, there was light. God saw the light that it was good. God called the light day, the night darkness he called night. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and God called the firmament. All those throughout all of chapter 1 is Elohim. All right? And every one of these verbs that are associated with it are singular. So Elohim, plural, singular, called. Vereshith uh, bara Elohim. God created it. Genesis 1 1. Bara is singular. Right? So all of those are showing the magnitude. So they have to do with creation. But then we get down to verse 26. And this is the doozy, okay? This is the one that, see, when people don't understand figures of speech or if they try to be anachronistic and apply modern theology and things that were not part of Christianity until the 3rd and 4th century, and they try to apply those back onto monotheistic Christianity. They pick things out that seem to fit, and they're imposing their modern things upon ancient thought. And you get to verse 26, Genesis 1, 26. And it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over cattle, all over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, this is the verse that they try to use to prove that either God's a trinity, if they're one of those four groups that I have offended in this teaching, or uh, or a committee of super beings. That's the other group I've offended, the mystics. But, okay, they, they say, well, God said, let us make man in our image. So, God is in us. But, wait a minute. Why don't they read the next verse? Look at the next verse, verse 27. 
So God, Elohim, created man in his singular own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, why is verse 26 plural and verse 27 singular? Verse 26 is figurative. Verse 27 is literal. That's the only way you can harmonize that. So that's why I refer to some of these people as as one verse Charlies. (laughs) Because they just go to one verse and they harp on that one verse and they don't look at the rest of the verses on the subject. And especially, verse 27 follows immediately upon verse 26. Do you think that maybe when Moses wrote this, that he was aware of what kind of confusion there might be? (laughs) Especially coming out of polytheistic Egypt that had a trinity? I mean, why do you think they harped on I, the Lord thy God, am one Lord. They had just come out of a polytheistic environment. Let's see. Wow. So, I think verse 27 is there to clarify any misunderstandings from verse 26. It is the majestic plural. Like, we the Queen of England say this, and <laughs> we are not pleased <laughs> with, with the wrong interpretation. <laughs> But now, this is not the only time that it's used. Look at Genesis 11. Genesis 11, verse 7. It says, Go to now, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And so they point at this and say, See, here it is again. Wait a minute. Don't be a one verse Charlie again. Look at this in context, and this will knock your socks off. Genesis 11, verse 4. And they said, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, that we lest we be scattered upon all the face of the earth. You know what this is talking about? Shem was God's representative. He was God's prophet upon the earth at that time. And do you know what Shem means? Name. Okay? Shem, in the believer's line, was teaching the word. He was talking about God's name. So all the unbelievers come out and they say, well, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which men have built. And the Lord said, behold, The people's one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they've imagined to do. Look at the power of like-mindedness. So, these unbelievers, in challenge to to Shem, those guys had said, let us build us a city. And so God says, let us go down and confound their language. He said it that way. They rub their noses in it. Mm-hmm. Can you see the context there? That's See, it's a figure of speech. It's used for a purpose. Mm-hmm. And the purpose was, I'm going to rub your blankety blank noses in the truth. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build a city. You know, it, it's so neat. The word fits. And every time I've run into an apparent contradiction or something like that, the answer has been right there. Mm-hmm. It's been right there. See? And they've just been one verse Charlie's and they haven't seen it. They only go as far as corroborating their own idea and they don't go any further. See? Here's another example of it. Genesis 29. This is about Jacob and Rachel. So, Jacob goes up to the northern area of the Fertile Crescent, and he found Rachel, falls in love with Rachel, and Laban is Rachel's father. So, verse 20, Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for his love that he had for her. And Jacob said to Laban, Okay, now I've worked seven years. Give me my wife. For my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place, made a feast. And it came to pass that he took Leah, 
his daughter had brought her to him. It was dark. She had a veil on. Okay? So, <laughs> and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah! <laughs> and he said to Laban, what is this that you've done to me? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? What have you become? And now look at this. Verse 26. And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week and we, Laban says. Well, Laban's not a we. Fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for the service which thou wilt serve me yet another seven years. <laughs> and Jacob did so and fulfilled her speech and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So Laban is is in a position, being the father and having authority. So accordingly, he uses that figure to emphasize, well, I'm the father and I say what's going on, so I have the authority and you just have to live with it. So he said, we. You see it? Okay. That's, that's how this, this is used to express the magnanimousness of this. Isn't that interesting? Let's see. So, that's let us make man in our image. That's how that all works. Let's see. So, the Orthodox Christian teaching that Genesis 126 reflects God speaking in multiple persons is anachronistic. It's acultural. It's not the way they would speak. No Hebrew believer back then would have thought of that back then when it was first written, that it meant that, especially having rejected Egypt and everything Egyptian, including the Egyptian trinity of Amun, Re, and Ptah. Okay, so we'll finish up here in the next little bit here with showing a difference between Yahweh and Elohim. Now I'm getting a little bit of ahead in my outline because... Elohim is God the creator and Jehovah is God in relationship to what he has created. The Greek word theos makes no such distinction but in the Old Testament you can see distinctions if you find places where both those words are used close together and then you can see the difference. Well one place I showed you is all the way through Genesis chapter 1 Elohim is used. Well that's the creation but then Genesis chapter 2 it's Yahweh Elohim is used. So, chapter 2, verse 4, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, which they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused rain upon the earth, for there was no man to till the ground. Then there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living soul and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put his man whom he had formed and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil now in chapter 2, Lord God is Jehovah Elohim. So, But chapter 2 is after the world had been created, and now he's relating to it. Okay, Here's another one. Genesis chapter 7. Talk about the animals in the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Noah, Come down, thou and all thy house, into the Ark for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and female, and of the beasts that are not clean, two by two. So, the Lord Jehovah said in verse 1, then, verse 9, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, male and female, as God, Elohim, had commanded Noah. Well, what's the difference? Well, the sevens were used for sacrifice that has to do with the relationship. Mm -hmm. And the twos have to do with preserving species and generation that's more aligned with creation. Mm -hmm. See the difference. Another one. Second Chronicles 18 
2 Chronicles 18. This is with Jehoshaphat fighting the king of Syria. 2 Chronicles 18, verse 30 and 31. It says, Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. So the king of Syria, his strategy was find the king of Israel and kill him. Don't fight with anyone else. And if we behead the army, then so. What Jehoshaphat had done. See, Jehoshaphat was not a king of Israel. He was a king of Judah. And it was one of the times that he had allied himself with the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. God said, don't do it. But he did it. And so this battle occurs in verse 31. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, it's the king of Israel. He wasn't the king of Israel. He was the king of Judah that had allied himself to fight. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So the Lord Jehovah helped Jehoshaphat, and God, Elohim, moved them to depart from him. So Jehovah is the relationship, and God used his power, Elohim, to part them. Do you see the difference? So you see there's, that's the difference between the two. Elohim, God in, as a creator, and then Jehovah is God in his relationship to the creation. And we're going to see that that is very important later on so I think that's where I'm going to stop but I mean to, to ferret through all of this stuff and, and wade through in the midst of those four huge arguments was very taxing but I've made it out alive <laughs> so God bless you that's session two